Shall we start? Okay. Hello, my name is Cornelius. My surname is pronounced Kölbel. And um, today I would like to show you uh, a new aspect of two factor authentication, um, especially what, uh, what makes two factor authentication finally successful two-factor authentication. And in my opinion, it is the smooth workflows or smooth workflows make two-factor authentication successful two-factor authentication. Um, I guess till now you all have somehow heard of two-factor authentication and who of you actually is using two-factor authentication today? Um, okay, um, the last row there I see does not use it yet, but uh, this <laughs> might change. Or maybe you don't use it yet because you say, oh, there's no successful two-factor authentication till now, but this will change. <coughs> so first, some words about me. Um, we are on a Linux conference. I started Linux with a, a German Linux distribution in 19, 1994. Um, the distribution was later acquired by Red Hat. And I started with two-factor authentication in 2005. At first, it was uh, smart cards, also for <coughs> uh, a certain proprietary operating system. And um, I also am involved with hardware security modules. And in 2014, I started the project Privacy Idea. And you can reach me via email or these Twitter handles. As you uh, might realize by my funny surname, I am from Germany, especially from Kassel. And um, yeah, interesting, Kassel, we have the biggest mountain park in Europe. It's quite easy to have the biggest. You only have to define something very special, and then you have the biggest. And uh, this is the uh, uh, Her Hercules. Um, he's uh, standing on top of on top of a mountain uh, with a three meter big head and everything nice. And uh, this is uh, the, the Lions Castle. The uh, count back then, 200 years ago, he was just fond of uh, the medieval ages and he liked to play around. Um, but as you can see today, I'm at <laughs> Bellingham. Yeah. So what happened? Yeah, I moved across the world, and we all probably move across the world. And so uh, the question is, uh, we travel around, and um, what, do you want, what do we want to do with our data, yeah? or with the access to our data? And of course, we want to secure the access to our data. And this is why we probably also want to do two-factor authentication. Um, <clears throat> because the interesting thing is still, um, with two-factor authentication, although who, who of you heard of uh, FIDO2, for example? Yeah, FIDO2 is, uh, as the number indicates, the second version of an idea by FIDO. Maybe you heard of U2F. And um, this very same proprietary operating system vendor also thinks of, oh, users could use a hardware device to log into their operating system or to log into the uh, cloud. And, um, and only the hardware device. And I think this is a bit difficult because this actually is one factor authentication, especially only the hardware device. And if you travel somewhere, um, you might not want to expose your only hardware device that gives access to all your information, to all your data. And in this case, it's still very legit, in my opinion, to still have a password as a first factor, because uh, no one knows that I actually have a password, and no one knows my password. So we realize we want to do two-factor authentication because it's good for protecting data when traveling the world. Um, but who else wants to do two-factor authentication? Um, I saw, for example, that cities want to do two-factor authentication. Especially, I saw a project where a city um, plans to enroll two-factor authentication for all their citizens. 
so that all the citizens, uh, one million citizens, can access services provided by the city um, to access these services. And of course, you can imagine that this is a bit too difficult to handle to enroll maybe one million second factors to all the citizens. Um, okay, given the average family size, it might only be 300,000 second factors, but who cares? Um, also, universities want to enroll um, two factors, for example, for the students. And this is also a bit difficult uh, because uh, after several years, the student is not a student anymore. Or next year, a new student will come. So you have very, a very um, vivid uh, or uh, often changing uh, user base. Um, energy providers want to use uh, two-factor authentication. And of course, all the services you are using as a, a private user on the internet think it's a good idea to use a second factor. Well, um, actually, a, a, a short recap. What is a second factor? Or the idea of the second factor, of course, is to um, make it more difficult for an attacker to get into my account. <clears throat> for example, if the attacker is very good in um, orchestrating SQL injections or brute forcing passwords, then it might be a good idea to, to use a smart card. Because the attacker might be not that good in going out of his dark room, going into real life, and stealing my smart card. Um, interesting enough, there are a lot of uh, people who made us believe that's a good idea to use uh, some biometric aspects as a second factor. Um, maybe you've been to the talk of uh, Markus Feiner this morning with the security theater, and he already pointed out, for example, um, that your fingerprint is a bit difficult because um, what do you do when you think your, your account has been compromised to you change your password and it's uh, rather difficult to change my fingers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so you see there's a big variety of possible second factors and the <clears throat> question is what is, uh, in which scenario which second factor is the best to use. Nevertheless, many people or services or companies want to make us believe or want to, want to make us think, oh, actually there are two second factors is, for example, a text message sent to my phone. And I see this, that this is often um, used as a synonym, so if someone is talking about uh, two-factor authentication. Several people always think of, yeah, of course, it's uh, my smartphone sent a text message to my smartphone, or maybe an app on my smartphone. But I just want to make clear there is a big variety of other possibilities and mostly more secure possibilities. I especially do not say better possibilities, but more secure possibilities. Okay, so. Um, Two-factor authentication is easy. Um, I can implement it as a service. I have my users simply install Google Authenticator as a smartphone app, or I simply have my users enter their um, mobile phone number. Then I can send them an SMS. Quite easy. Well, but... Uh, <clears throat> Again, I made a small Twitter search, and for example, um, I was wondering how, how do users think about two-factor authentication? Or when they talk about two-factor authentication, what they are talking about? And here, for example, they are talk talking about, well, um, your app that I should use for uh, two-factor authentication sucks, and um, it does not work out, and I do not know how to use it. Of course, this is bad. Um, because uh, if users cannot use, or if it's too difficult for the users to use two-factor authentication, they will not do it. 
or um, <laughs> funny enough, I experienced this myself. PayPal nowadays only provides two-factor authentication via SMS. Uh, I, I have a very old account where I still have a hardware key fob token, but if you register today, you can only authenticate via SMS. And sometimes this takes a bit of time. And this, of course, is annoying. Why do you use PayPal? You want to send money quickly. And you want to send money now. <laughs> and <laughs> lately I was waiting, I don't know, half an hour, and the SMS didn't come at all. So I tried it again a few hours later, and it worked. But that's not fun. Yeah. <clears throat> or users realize, OK, hey, hey, Apple, you could exchange the uh, name Apple with everything else. Um, why, don't you, why don't you provide other authentication methods? For example, here, U2F for two-factor authentication. Or, um, yeah, maybe you have set up two-factor authentication for your account. Everything works fine. But then you lose your phone, it is stolen, or whatever. And there's no backup method. This is, of course, also not good. And um, there should be a backup message, uh, a backup method. Well, and finally, we see two-factor authentication is not the holy grail. It is not everything. Um, he complains about, yeah, OK, Microsoft, you have great two-factor authentication. But I have to do two-factor authentication with every service of you where I log in. So doing single sign-on would be quite, quite, a, uh, quite nice here. And um, yeah. So to sum up, what problems do we have with two-factor authentication? Um, users are also dislocated. They are my, my users are sitting around the world. My users will not stop by at the administrator's desk, probably. Um, take the city. Not every citizen will uh, come to the uh, town hall and uh, get a second factor. Um, often users are unknown. So, um, and most of the time, the bigger my user base is, it is more likely that my users are not tech savvy anymore. Yeah, just uh, one small side note. <clears throat> Who of you knows the Google Authenticator or uh, Authy or something like this? Or um, free OTP, we are in an open source conference. <clears throat> okay, not that many. After all, when you use two-factor authentication, usually it's, it's, or it's always about some kind of cryptographic material. If you have a smart card, you have a public-private key pair. If you have um, uh, the, the old classic RSA secure ID token or comparable key fob tokens, they have a secret key, a symmetric secret, uh, secret key, which is used to calculate these one-time passwords. And um, even with biometrics, usually you don't, do not store the fingerprint, but you store um, some, just some information about the fingerprint, usually in a hashed well, um, way and so on. So usually it boils down to have some secret information. And this is what um, initially Google and now many other um, companies all do with an uh, app. So the, you have an app for your smartphone, and uh, the smartphone replaces the classical key fob tool. Um, well, but the classical key fob tokens are usually based on an algorithm which was uh, designed and is also written down in an RFC um, by a few hardware vendors in roughly 2005. And 2005 was actually a bit before 
the start of the iPhone 1, so before we had smartphones around. So um, it's, it's quite interesting because I would say the classical one-time password mechanism is not meant for smartphones. And yet you can see it here with Google, it's very easy. They invented, well, they made up the idea, okay, let's use a QR code, and the QR code would contain the secret key that is used to generate the one-time passwords. The user can scan it quite easy, and everything is fine. But the problem is, everything you use for the two-factor authentication is contained in this QR code. So everyone who's scanning this QR code will have, and you are free to uh, verify this, will have the one-to-one uh, -one copy of this second factor for authentication. And this, of course, is a bit sad because why are we doing two-factor authentication? We are doing two-factor authentication so that we can identify the user very precisely, very secure, and if I can, of course, uh, generate copies very easily, this is a counterproduct. So, <clears throat> I wrote a wish list or requirements for two-factor authentication. In my opinion, you should be able to choose your technology or choose your, your, your method. It's not okay simply to rely on sending text messages or to use um, smartphone apps. Um, it's okay to use smartphone apps, but you maybe think about, mm, I use it in certain situations, and other situations I would maybe prefer to use uh, some hardware devices. You should be vendor independent, of course, which means um, your two-factor solution should be open source. You should allow for backup methods. So it is wise to be able to provide more second factors to the user so that he can react or that he can still log in if he lost one. It should be easy to use. And <clears throat> from a certain um, number of users, you probably will have a help desk. And if you have a help desk, you have to define your processes. And um, yeah, you have a help desk, but this does not mean that the help desk wants to do everything manually, so you have to have automated workflows. And um, this is why I am of the opinion that successful two-factor authentication is a matter of smooth workflows. <laughs> you might know this guy. So um, who does not know this uh, YouTube video? Okay, this is a, uh, I think, a, a musician who constructed the marble machine. He has uh, thousands of marbles in this machine, and the, um, the marbles are, um, well, pumped around, and they fall down on this, well, uh, xylophone? Xylophone. Yeah. yeah. And on the guitar, and, and on the bass drum, and ev everywhere. And um, so it's uh, programmed, programmed, that the marbles uh, fall in the right moment um, in the right direction. And I think this is a nice example that yeah, if you think before what can happen and what you want to achieve, you can automate those processes perfectly. Yeah, but today we don't want to make music, but we want to authenticate. And this is why I want to introduce you uh, to Privacy Idea. This is um, a system for authentication and management of second factors. So, who of you knows Privacy Idea? Oh, well, yeah. I, I Googled it before the talk and got all excited about it, and now I'm running it. Okay, he, he, he knows how to use Google Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's fine, because then I can uh, transport more information here. So, what is privacy idea? Oh, the, the important part, in the beginning we were asked, okay, what is it? Is it a firewall? No, it is no firewall. So, um, you have your applications, for example, web applications. Um, usually, the web applications would 
be configured so that they maybe ask an LDAP directory and users would authenticate as a web application against LDAP. What Privacy Idea does is you install Privacy Idea on a server in your network, you connect your LDAP to Privacy Idea or have Privacy Idea read the users from the LDAP directory, your existing users, and then you can manage and start assigning authentication objects, be it smartphones or hardware devices, a YubiKey, to these users. So now Privacy Idea knows which user has which hardware devices, plural, and um, how it can authenticate these users. Then you reconfigure your web application and have them verify the users against Privacy Idea. The most common scenario probably is having a firewall or a VPN because uh, these network devices are designed for, um, for authentication purposes. And so usually, for example, they support the RADIUS protocol and then you simply can reconfigure your firewall without installing any, everything else on the firewall. Reconfigure the firewall to authenticate the users via radius against privacy idea. And then it's as easy as preparing the second factors for the users and one day um, reconfigure the firewall and bam, all your users uh, need two factors to authenticate uh, to the VPN. Yeah. So how, the, how did all this happen? Actually, I think somehow it started in, in 2005 or 2006. Um, I have been a, a consultant and been working with the Aladdin eToken NG. Who of you knows Aladdin before it was acquired by SafeNet, before it was acquired by Gemalto, before it was acquired <laughs> by uh, uh, Thales, I think? Huh? Okay, anyhow, it's a... It is a classical proprietary vendor of software and hardware, but they did one thing right because they used this open algorithm, which I mentioned previously, and this hardware device here had this unique feature back then that you could initialize it. Even now, today, if you, have you ever seen, so, so if, if, if you buy a hardware device which generates one-time passwords, this is usually preceded, and um, which means the vendor, your RSA secure ID is preceded. The vendor um, programmed a secret key on the hardware and gives you the secret key in a file. And every now and then, every decade, RSA has to say, okay, someone, uh, entered in our network and we are not sure if our secrets are <laughs> <laughs> So, and this is the great thing. If you, as the user, as the, uh, who is who's using your means of authentication, if you can initialize it on your own, under your control, of course, this is a big step forward for security. And this was very great then, 10 years ago. Um, this is the RFC I mentioned. And in 2010, we started with a predecessor of Privacy Idea, and finally, uh, Privacy Idea started as a fork in 2014. And now, roughly two years ago, we added the event handlers to Privacy Idea, which is uh, a core feature I will talk about now. <clears throat> so, I have this list of requirements, and I just want to check now if how the uh, requirements are met here. So I said we should be able to choose our technology, and this is great because uh, Privacy Idea has a, it is written in Python, and um, it implements token types as a as a base class, and many different token types are inherited from this uh, base class. 
And um, actually, we are supporting quite a lot of the usual HOTP and TOTP tokens, which also include smartphone apps. We uh, support the UV keys. These are uh, very interesting products which originated in Sweden and which you can initialize, another hardware device which you can initialize. And uh, actually, who of you knows the UV key? Okay. It looks like this, yeah. and the great thing is uh, no batteries included. So, um, <laughs> and it actually does not need any battery. So, um, in theory, you could use it for lifetime till the used algorithms are too weak and you would have to replace it after. Uh, you don't have to replace it after three years. You see, we, we even support some, some strange things like uh, sending uh, authentication codes via SMS or, or via email. Of course, this is not the most secure way to do this, but we can do this. And in a combination of different mechanisms, this might uh, also make sense. And of course, um, so as we are using a, a base class here, we have the possibility to, to enhance the authentication methods. So if in two years there is a shiny new um, two-factor mechanism, we probably will be able to implement this without changing the core code, without um, changing our workflows. And I think this makes privacy idea rather future-proof. In the web UI, uh, this looks like this. Um, of course, this is not very easy for the administrator if he has such a long dropdown list, but you can configure this and decide what uh, methods you would allow to the uh, user. So if, any, ever, if someone from the military or is here, we even support something like a four eyes token to, to implement a two-man principle or something like this. So the second requirement was to be vendor independent. Yeah, check, we are open source under the AGPL version 3. To me, open source means more than the pure license. Um, to me, open source means that you can use it freely. I personally, I don't know how you feel, I don't like open source when a company says, well, we have uh, software that's open source, and uh, you can click here and register here and give me all your email address and birth date and so on, and then you can download the open source software. For me, this is not. Yeah, from a license standpoint, this is open source, but it does not feel right. We are uh, hosted on GitHub, and uh, we also use GitHub very strongly for our issues and for our uh, reviews, pull requests, and so on. Um, Moreover, privacy idea does not bind you to a single vendor. So you, now you could use uh, key fob tokens of vendor A, and next year you could key fob tokens, use key fob tokens of vendor B. So you can mix and match just like you want to do. The requirement three was, uh, was the guy who um, on Twitter who, who said, okay, if you activate your two-factor authentication, you should not lose your phone, otherwise you are locked out. And um, for us, this is no, pro uh, no problem. In privacy idea, you can assign as many authentication devices um, to the user as you want to. You can also assign uh, authentication devices of different type. So a user could have a YubiKey, which is a very strong, uh, authentication device, and it could have authentication codes via email, both this. And using policies, but using policies, you could also decide in which scenarios he has to use the YubiKey because it is more secure, and in which scenarios he could, can use an email because it's, uh, uh, it's more convenient. Yeah? Um, does it have uh, facilities for requiring multiple uh, devices for one login? Like, for a specific login, you have to use both devices? Uh, so, if you can require multiple devices to log in? Yeah, so like if it had to do, like, oh, you have to click the thing in the email and you have to do the, mm -hmm. the is, there, is there a feature for that right now? Or? You probably could somehow uh, 
um, uh, yeah, you could probably do this somehow, maybe also via this uh, two-man rule thing, um, but I don't know any checkbox where you can activate <laughs> such things. Yeah. But uh, we have not that many checkboxes as you will see later. Okay. Yeah, and the user can have several authentication devices and either the help desk, automated processes, or he himself can assign those authentication devices to him. Here you can see um, my details of the user, and um, here you can see these are my authentication devices, my tokens. This from the serial number, I know that this is a hardware device. I could also click here on the link and would see the details of this authentication device. And this is a, a smartphone. Easy to use. Two-factor authentication should be easy to use. Yeah, of course, we have a token wizard. Okay. Mm. <laughs> it's a wizard. He does any, everything for you. Well, it's a, it helps um, uh, the, the onboarding process for a user, for the initial rollout, so he's not confused with a very complex um, self-service portal, but he's, he can just click next, next, yes, done. And um, even if you use the self-service portal, you can define what the user is actually allowed to do. But the most interesting probably is that we have a REST API. So actually, you can do what you want. Or let's take it this way. You can integrate certain aspects into your existing um, web pages. For example, if you have a, uh, some, some intranet web page and the user has already certain preferences there where he can configure or reset his password. You can simply add, for example, the preference to um, enroll a second factor or to reset a second factor or to mark a second factor as lost. And this actually works pretty nice. The W3C uh, implemented it this way. So it, the system privacy idea can work in the background without a user ever seeing or realizing that their uh, privacy idea is, is working there because the whole interface the user would see looks like um, the interface he's used to. Okay, help desk. Um, we have a policy framework which, uh, which has a lot of different scopes or areas for what you can configure. Um, for example, we have the admin scope, which defines what an administrator is allowed to do. And this way, you can um, very fine-grained define what a help desk uh, employee would be allowed to do. And um, there's a lot of... So this policy framework actually um, gives you a lot of possibilities to fine-tune how privacy idea would respond to any request. And uh, if we had another hour, we could also dive into this policy framework. Um, well, interesting, the policy framework work, works on the API level, which means even if you integrate it into your own web interface, um, the policies are still enforced. And you can define the policies based on users or LDAP groups. And this way, you can even uh, take an existing LDAP group of the IT department and declare that these IT department would be, for example, the help desk user, uh, the help desk users with certain rights in privacy idea. Yeah, it's all about automation of tedious tasks. And again, if you think of a university with 30,000 students who, is, uh, who has 5,000 new students every year, then you have to enroll 5,000 new users every year. And this, uh, this sounds uh, tedious. There are several levels where you can 
automate processes and privacy on here and create work flows. It's the database level. Well, it's, it's well documented. It's, it's open source. It's library calls, the REST API, and the event handler. Um, the library calls actually are Python libraries, and everything that can be done in the web UI, everything that can be done in the REST API, finally, um, is a Python library call. So you can also implement uh, functionality into scripts, and so we don't need the web server to run. And there are actually several scripts using it this way. We have a, a token generator. Um, for some tasks, it's important to, uh, to clean up the database. For example, if you have orphan tokens, which means you assign a token to a user once, and then the user left the LDAP or does not exist in the LDAP anymore. But the privacy idea still thinks that this token is assigned to a user. And you can use such scripts to yeah, clean up your database. Wait a second here. Um, the API is, is an API where you can initialize tokens. You can get a list of the tokens. You can delete tokens. So um, actually, you can do everything that you want, and you will um, the call will return a JSON response, which can be passed and further used. OK. <clears throat> Workflows. Um, I said, oh, we should require workflows if we do two-factor authentication. And the interesting thing, actually, is yeah, we, we developed this event handler framework to yeah, to uh, be able to automate tasks. But actually, we do not know what for. The interesting thing is that every now and then users come around and say, oh, we configured it this and that way, and um, we want to achieve this and that, this and that. And um, we, we just drop our jaw and say, oh, ooh, we never thought of this. And um, it started with, um, it started with a user who said, OK, I would like to notify the user if an administrator um, enrolls a token for this user. Well, this is a simple request. We could implement it this uh, immediately, no problem. But uh, we said, well, hmm, OK, yeah, I understand this requirement. But unfortunately, this is requirement is too specific. And so we came up, OK, let's, let's do an abstraction of this, and let's do an abstraction of this, and let's even do uh, more extract, uh, abstraction of this. So what actually does the event handler do? Um, the event handler attaches to an API request. And then it can trigger an additional new action in contrast to the policies which define how a privacy idea would behave, this event handler really does something completely new. As I said, for example, it can notify someone. It can modify tokens. Um, and it will, of course, only do this if certain conditions are met. So with each request, the conditional set is checked. If conditions are met, then a new action is triggered. And again, we chose a modular approach. Again, a, a Python-based class. And you probably could start your own event handler with uh, roughly 40, uh, 50 lines of code. So, And um, yeah, each module can define its own conditions and its own actions. And currently, we have these event handlers. We can notify someone via, we can modify tokens. We can do some kind of federation, which means if something happens, we can forward a request to another privacy idea instance. And now, we can run scripts. This is totally evil. Yeah, if, if, 
a special request um, hits privacy idea. And if certain um, conditions are met, we can define whichever shell script we wrote so that it will be executed. And we have a very new counter handler which simply would count how often this event would occur. Um, we will use this for a more detailed uh, monitoring and statistics module. <clears throat> okay, conditions. How do conditions look like? For example, we could check if a user is an, an administrator or if he's a normal user. If uh, the user who's authenticating is in a certain realm, we can check for the result of the of uh, the request, we can check for error messages, and yeah. Then we have conditions that are somehow token specific, and this is very interesting because we could, for example, check how often was this token used for authentication, for um, successfully or unsuccessfully. For example, imagine you have a token, and you say, okay, if this token is used more than 100 times for an unsuccessful authentication, then either I have a breach or the user does not know how to use the token. So I could, for example, create an event which would, which would say, okay, if a token was used unsuccessfully more than 100 times, then, then something should happen, the user should be notified, the administrator should be notified, or the token should be deleted or whatever. And, um, also, a very mighty thing is the token info, because this is a, um, there I can store arbitrary additional information for tokens. For example, um, real world example, um, when a token is en enrolled and is shipped via snail mail to the user, then I can automatically mark this token as shipped. And if for any reason I can run a query on my database and see which tokens are shipped. If the user starts uh, to use this token, I could um, automatically run an event which would delete this token info that the, uh, the token is shipped or I would change the info to token is used. Again, automatically. And um, finally we have user specific conditions like um, how many tokens does a user have? Does a user, if, if a user deletes his last token, what would, what would happen? The user cannot authenticate anymore. You could define an event, so if the user has zero tokens, then automatically create a new token for the user, for example, of the type registration, so that he gets a registration code which then can be sent automatically to the user so that he can again create a new token. Just making all this up. So how does this look like? Um, this is how defining an event uh, looks like. You choose uh, here, I want to use the user notification module. I want to attach this event to these events here. And um, if this happens, uh, uh, email should be sent and the email should be sent to the token owner and this is the contents of the email and as you can see, I can also use some tags as, uh, so to personalize the email. <coughs> yeah, this is the uh, token handler and I can, as I mentioned, I can delete tokens but I as I said, I can enroll it, I can enable it, disable them. Um, this is the token info. I can set the token info to an, any arbitra arbitrary value. I can also set dates. I could, for example, set the dates in five months. For example, to later check, is, is this date exceeded? If for any reason, something happens and this thing happening would mean that in five months should happen something else. I can do this with, with this event handler here. Well, I have some examples how in the past the event handler helped. 
And one thing, for example, is the what I already said, the administrator enrolls a token, the event token in it. This is the enrollment of the token. Uh, the handler notification is used. The condition is the user is an administrator. Of course, if the user himself enrolls a token, the user does not need to be notified. Well, maybe you want this. And then the user gets an email. Another example is the students I mentioned. Also, the uh, uh, enrollment of the token, the token handler was used again, also only applicable if the user is an administrator. And they actually set this token info field and they also disabled the token. So to be sure, when the token is shipped via uh, snail mail, that, uh, and if it's intercepted, that the token cannot be used yet. So they enroll the token and automatically it gets an initial information, a status information, and it is automatically uh, in a disabled state. Then, ah, yeah. This is a bit tricky because usually the TOTP algorithm in RFC 6238 requires that you keep track of a time drift of the clock of a hardware device. And the user said, oh, I don't like this. And then I said, well, but this is the way the, it's supposed to be. Oh, no, I want to have it in another way. I don't like implementing, uh, I don't like writing code. So I, uh, if, if I write code, I always try to write less code, and um, think more, write less. And so um, we realized, oh, of course, we can use the event handler. So um, if in the event of an authentication request, and if the authentication request is, is successful, and another condition could be if the token type is a TOTP token, the token handler takes care of set token info and the time drift as it is requested by the RFC is also saved in a token info field. So in this case, we can set this time drift to zero each time the user successfully authenticates. So uh, mission accomplished. So you see, as I said initially, um, just like IT security we know is a process, um, in my opinion, successful two-factor authentication is a matter of smooth workflows. Thank you for your patience, for your interest. I'm done. <laughs> yes? So most of this was talking about the, the cool features and the user side of it. On the server side, for example, we've got 500 web servers that do HTTP basic against LDAP, or you know, things that have a little login, username, and password, it goes check against LDAP and it sets you a cookie and knows who you are. Looking at the website, it looks like you would need to you know, put an Apache module or an Nginx module in there to handle those. Do you guys offer a service that sits in front of LDAP so I can just point all generic things at it and instead of me putting my password, I put my password plus my two factor authentication and it would just or do I need to repeat this question? So uh, I, I guess you read the website. Yeah, <laughs> we. Um, it looks awesome. So um, the question was if I have a lot of uh, applications, a lot of servers which should add two-factor authentication, I would have to install something or connect every application to privacy idea. This is right. This is uh, usually, I think, also the preferred way. You can set up a redundant privacy idea setup and have your applications uh, communicating to privacy idea. This is usually the nicer setup because you have more possibilities if you use the REST API. You can do challenge response. You can use uh, error codes, response codes. But in fact, we also have a, an LDAP proxy, which, as you said, sits in front of the original LDAP server and your application would be connected to this LDAP proxy. The application would 
talk normal LDAP. Um, usually an application, if a user wants to authenticate, would take the credentials and send an LDAP bind to the LDAP server, our uh, LDAP proxy. Uh, the presentation should be over in like a minute or so. Yeah. yeah. The, the LDAP proxy um, then handles this bind request and asks privacy idea. If, you, if the LDAP needs to uh, search something, it searches in the original LDAP server. And yeah, you can do this. This um, is actually quite nice, but as I said, for example, the, the, um, an email or an SMS token is a challenge response token where, since we need to trigger the SMS. And this is not supported by the LDAP proxy in a nice way because the LDAP protocol does not allow this. Okay, thanks again. You can find the project on GitHub. Uh, you can find me around here. I'm here today and also tomorrow.